Well, in this lecture, I'm looking at, at three things, really. How the medicines were made from plants, the methods and the techniques, the ideas underpinning how they were used, and that's one of the things I find most interesting. What was the thinking behind it? And then, and this is the tricky bit, um, it can be difficult to gauge whether plant medicines in the past were effective. Not an easy thing to gauge always, but we'll look at some, some thoughts around that. Okay, well, plant medicine, um, it was present in all ancient civilizations. It was the form of medicine. Um, and we know that, for example, opium was grown for pain relief in ancient Assyria. The ancient Egyptians did that. Um, but to, to keep this manageable, I'll be focusing on British plant medicine. And as the title suggests, just the last thousand years from the Anglo-Saxon early medieval period. Okay, so what I'll start off by saying is it really struck me when I started looking at the Anglo-Saxon um, medicinal... Oh, sorry, when I started looking at the Anglo-Saxon um, medicinal texts, what struck me was how similar the techniques they were using then were to the techniques that, that people making herbal remedies today are using. It must be a case of, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. They, they s hit on methods that worked then and they seem to have carried on. So, for example, um, we'll look at the remedies made from bishop's wort that were recorded in about AD 1000 um, in a book called, or manuscript, that's now called the Old English Herbarium. And it gives 29 uses for this punk plant called bishop's wort. And we think that that was, in fact, wood betony. That's the best guess as to what bishop's wort was. But 29 uses. And just to look at just a few of them so we get an idea of the methods. Uh, for pain in the eyes, the direction was to take the plant's roots boil in water to a third, and with the water, bathe the eyes. So, herbalists amongst you, what, what have they described there? They've boiled the roots till the water's reduced by a certain amount. Decoction. Decoction. Well done, that lady. Yep. Um, so that's one. And that's a decoction using water. Uh, for toothache, they suggested another decoction but this time, the instruction was not to use water, but to boil betony in old water and vinegar. And that's actually one of the biggest differences between herbal remedies in past centuries and today, I think, is that you get a lot of wine used and a lot of honey used. And we're not sure if that was for medicinal reasons or simply to make bitter herbs taste a little bit nicer. That could be the reason as well. Whoops. Sorry, I'll just get my watch, so I'm not, I'm not keeping you too long for the first break. Okay. Right, so for feverishness, for temperature, um, betony was given um, steeped in hot water. So what's that, steeped in hot water? Tea, or the medical term for a tea? Infusion, that's it. Actually, infusions, that's the way we do things most often today, isn't it? If people are doing remedies for themselves at home, it's usually an infusion. In the past, infusions are mentioned fairly infrequently. It's usually decoction that's mentioned. And I think, my hunch on this, is it simply what was easiest to do? Today, it's easiest for us just to flick on an electric kettle. That's the easiest way, pour it in a mug. In the past, no electric kettles, obviously. You've, um, it's usually a pot over a fire. So in that instance, with those utensils, decoction's the easiest way to do it. 
So I think that's the difference. Whereas today we might say, well, an infusion for soft leafy plants, parts of the plant, and decoction for the more woody parts um, and roots and berries, that kind of thing. But in the past, it seems to be decoctions the, the favourite all the way. Uh, then again, for eye pain, um, bishop's wart leaves crushed and laid on the eyes. So what's that? We've crushed the leaves and just laid them on. Poultice? That's it, poultice. Um, and then an ointment was made um, for a boil, and that's made in the same way that ointments have been made for centuries afterwards. So to reduce a boil, let him take one tremesis weight, pound with old grease, lay it on the place where he wanted the boil to reduce, then it shall soon be well. Well, I don't know about old grease. We probably wouldn't do that today, but certainly for a long time, Lard was the, the medium of choice, and you could simply just, just pound it in, that was acceptable, um, or boil up the, the, the herb in the lard. I've tried this at home, it's, it's, oh, it makes your house smell like a chip shop. So I don't recommend, if you boil in butter, it's, it's a much nicer experience for everybody. So, um, so just as when we make a plant medicine today, how these remedies worked, um, you're releasing the chemicals from the plant in a form that can be taken internally or applied. So that's why when you're using um, hot water in a decoction or infusion, the hot water draws out the chemicals into itself and then the plant's discarded. Once the chemicals are in the liquid, we're no longer interested in the plant. It's done its job. It's, it's thrown away. Um, and amongst those chemicals, one, will be the, one or two will be the, the active ingredient, the chemical that's, that's doing the, giving the medicinal benefit you want. Now, the Anglo-Saxons obviously didn't understand this process. All that they knew were that these methods were effective. Right, so, um, by the way, this image we've got here, this is a manuscript from about 1000 AD. It's showing henbane. Up the top, can you see there's two little winged creatures? It was believed in the Anglo-Saxon period that they talk about diseases caused by flying venom or, um, or elf shot. Flying venom or elf shot. And I've, we think that's infections where they didn't know where they, were, where they were coming from. So maybe those little images up there are depicting these mysterious causes of the illness. But this was a period in time, oh sorry, that was, that was the wood betony that might be bishop's wart. Okay. So in the Anglo-Saxon period, you're at a time where there's a transition between paganism and Christianity, it's still not entirely complete. Um, and we can see this, this is something called the Frank's casket, it's an ebony box and we've got panels of it shown here. And at the top, it's the, the, three, the three kings or the magi visiting the baby Jesus. Can you make that out? Yeah. And underneath, that's representing the pagan Germanic god Woden. Um, and rather than uh, alphabet lettering, it's got the old Germanic runes as well. So again, a sort of a, a pagan association. So everything was still mixed up. And you see this reflected in the medicine. So in um, something called the Laknunga manuscript of about 1000 AD again, it's a very lengthy recipe for what's called a holy salve. And it's made up from no less than 58 herbs. Um, and in this one recipe, it's very long, otherwise I'd read it out to you. 
there seems to be um, Christian elements, pagan elements, and magic as well thrown in. So, um, Christian elements. One of the ingredients of part of these 58 herbs and the powder of a black snail is water that has been hallowed by a font hallowing, whatever that was, and then the plants, all the plants are hallowed by a priest. And then the salve is to be stirred with a spoon and the handle of the spoon's been cut into four lengthwise and Matthew, Mark, Luke and John written on each length. And while it was being made, um, whoever was making it had to sing over it psalms and litanies, um, glory to God in the highest, this kind of thing, a lot more than I've just read out. And then there's these mag magical elements. The butter you're using to make the sal from is to be made from a cow of a single colour so that she be all brown or white and unmarked. There's, um, there's something called the snake charm, and that's a pre-Christian thing, and that was to be sung nine times over the salve while it was being made. And nine times is always a magical number. And then it was followed by the ritual of spitting in the bowl, nice, <laughs> and then blowing on it. So, so there's that one. Um, and there were other remedies that were not, not even taken internally or applied. So, um, the same manuscript says, if you observe a hare in the summertime, um, if it's got overheated running around the field, it will eat lettuce leaf to cool itself down. So, if you know somebody's got a fever, you can help them by putting lettuce leaf underneath their pillow. So it's not even coming into contact with them. And then the clincher is, they mustn't know that you've put the lettuce there. <laughs> so, so there's that one. And then another, um, a cure for a headache, was to tie the root of what they called whey bread, and we call plantain. It's called whey bread, because plant, it, I, if you've seen plantain in the wild, if you, you might notice it now, it always grows along the side of paths for some reason, sort of tracks in a meadow, that's where it grows. It somehow likes being trodden down for some reason. And so way, Anglo-Saxon is the same as we have it today, the uh, way of path, so it's way bread, that's what it was. But we think it's plantain, um, and it says if you've got a headache, tie the root around your neck and similarly for buttercup if somebody was a lunatic you take this plant bind it with a red thread about the man's neck got to be red under a waning moon in the month which is called april and the early part of october he shall soon be healed well i haven't got buttercup but this is a medieval manuscript drawing can you see the man's doing a handstand to show that he's a bit crazy? The, <laughs> the poor person's then been put in stocks. It looks like he's on a swing having a nice time, but it's in fact he's in stocks, manacle to it. But there's peony tied round his neck for, for lunacy as well. Now, what do you think? The ones I've described so far, do we think they're likely to have worked? No, no. The, even if we take all the magical elements out of the Holy Salve, um, 58 different herbs. Now, where I come from, I'm not a herbalist, and I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian. But my hunch is that if you've got 58 different herbs, even if some of them are very beneficial, they're going to be so diluted down by, by all the other herbs in there. So I'd have thought that something with an awful lot of ingredients is less likely to be effective than if it's just got a few in there. But if you think I'm wrong on that, at, at the end, do, do come back at me on that one. So that's one type of medicine. Um, but then there was another type running alongside that, 
where the ideas behind it were no more complicated than what you could learn from experience and observation. That's what underpinned it. And right next to the, directly above the, the direction for the Holy Salve, comes this. So before that humongously long, long recipe, we've now got a sleeping drink. Radish, hemlock, wormwood and henbane. Pound all the plants, put them into ale, let it stand for one night, let him drink it. So we've just got a few ingredients, a very simple technique that would bring out the active ingredients. In this case, we've got an infusion, a cold infusion in the ale. And this has all the hallmarks of remedy that would have been effective in the past. Few ingredients, simple technique, nothing too fussy. And this, it seems, would have been effective, though careful with the dosage. Remember, we've got hemla hemlock, sorry, hemlock, woodworm, wormwood and henbane all in the same concoction, quite dangerous. But if the doctor knows what he's doing, henbane induces sleep, hemlock and wormwood are both sedatives. I wasn't sure about the radish in there. Um, but sort of digging around, I found that radish is recommended as an aid to sleep by an American guide for nurses because it contains melatonin. And mel melatonin is a chemical that's produced by the body during sleep. And that's why radish is recommended as one of the foods that can, can, can help somebody with insomnia. So somehow, Somehow the Anglo-Saxons had hit on four plants that would be beneficial. It's quite amazing how they did that, presumably just through very careful observation of what worked. Now there's a herbalist in Hertfordshire called Frances Watkins, and she's currently doing research into whether Anglo-Saxon plants would have been effective for the conditions they were used to treat. So she's using... Um, the old English herbarium, because that's the one that the bishop's wort or betony recipes come from, because it takes the plant one by one, rather than have recipes where there were lots of different herbs in it. Um, so that makes it easy for her to test them. Um, and so what she does, she's taken a few already that have been analysed scientifically and looks to see if the Anglo-Saxon usage agrees with today's scientific uses. And in some instances, the answer is a definite yes. This is white whorehound. The Anglo-Saxons used it for painful joints and coughs. And white whorehound is a proven analgesic and expectorant. So yes, those uses, they knew what they were doing. Yarrow. Now, this was valued by the Anglo-Saxons as a, as a wound herb. And in the Old English Herbarium, they give four uses for it in that way. So for wounds which have been made with iron, pound with lard, and lay it on the wound. If the wound on someone be cool, and I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, but crush it very small and mix it with butter. For a head wound, powder to dust and put it onto the wound. And for a dog bite, crush and lay with wheat corn on the wound. Now today's analysis does show that yarrow is particularly good for wounds. It's vulnerary. Have I said that? Vulnerary? Yes. <laughs> it stops blood flow and it helps close wounds. It's also antibacterial, antimicrobial, so it's going to help uh, stop infection setting in. And it is today um, recommended as a home remedy if you've cut yourself and you're in the countryside. Um, what you can do is strip the leaves from a stem, crush them and pack them into the wound. Uh, for years in this, uh, in this country it was called carpenter's grass. Um, because carpenters cut themselves quite often, so they used it for that. And military surgeons used it until at least the American Civil War. So with yarrow and 
poor hound like the sleeping drink we've got a medicine based on observation on what worked now this may seem really obvious thing to do but the next period we're going to look at you can see that that medicine was based on very different ideas but before we leave this period are we really sure about what the thinking was? Um, for example, it says things like, vervain, if it's for liver pain, must be gathered on Midsummer's Day. Now, this sounds superstitious, doesn't it? And you get things also like gather it on the eve of the Feast of St. John. Is it superstitious? It could be practical. Um, herbs today as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's recommended that um, to be most beneficial, they're collected at a certain point in the year. So you might say this herb, pick between April and mid-May, this one between July and October. Now it's quite hard to remember this, isn't it? Especially if you've got lots and lots of different plants. Not easy to hold that in your mind in a pre-literate society. But People would know the church calendar, like the back of their hand. They know when the solstices are, for example. And so if you could remember that and, and that way, and the Feast of St. John sort of falls in the middle of the best time to pick it, then it might well have been for a very practical reason. But we simply, we simply don't know. But Frances Watkins, in her research, She's to make sure that she's not making assumptions and missing out things that might have had value. She's growing the herbs herself in her, near her home in Hertfordshire and she's using exactly the techniques that the manuscripts tell her to use. So if it says pick it on Midsummer's Day, she'll do that. If it says you've got to boil it in a vessel made of copper, she'll do that. Um, so it'd be quite interesting when uh, all our work's finished to see what comes out of that. Now, medieval and early modern period. I'm going to treat the whole period between the 1200s and the 1600s, treat them all as one, because the ideas and practices are essentially unchanging in that period. And they're very different from the Anglo-Saxon period. You'd think early medieval, medieval would be similar, but early medieval, and then med medieval proper are very different. So what's the differences? We've got new plants coming in. There we go. Um, the Anglo-Saxons, they weren't cut off from the world. They had things like um, cinnamon, which you can see the cinnamon bark at the back there. Um, but you've also, they've got, so cinnamon, cumin, pepper, ginger. These were things they already knew. But um, now we're getting new spices coming in. The trade routes are opening up. So we've got cardamom, cloves, frankincense, and myrrh, like down the front there. We've got new things coming in. And therefore, we're getting a new profession coming up. We're getting apothecaries for the first time. People who trade in the exotic, they, um, they would have things in their shop like like crocodiles, um, they were a symbol to show that that's what that they sold you things that you couldn't possibly get anywhere else. Um, they're starting to make money now. People are having to pay for their medicines now, um, and you've now got a wider range of methods for making the medicines. So, added to the infusions and the decoctions and the ointments and the poultices, we've now got syrups and inhalations fumigations and plasters and towards the end of the period increasingly pills and tinctures essential oils distilled waters electuaries and conserves so syrups were made the same way my husband makes rose hip syrup um, you boil the herb strain it through a cloth then the liquid that's left from that you add sugar boil it again there's a syrup fumigations, you could um, do things like hold a herb over a fire and then the fumes that come off could be inhaled. This is, I don't know, can you see the faint baby um, being held up and somebody's holding a sprig of mugwort. 
and that herb was being held over the fire and it was, the idea was to make the infant more lively if it was a bit lethargic. Um, <laughs> uh, plasters, these aren't sticking... <laughs> plasters weren't sticking plasters, but they're medication that's spread on a, on a warmed backing like leather or linen and left in contact with the skin. Tincture, that's a, a herb infused in alcohol for a period. Um, herbalists, what do we know what use today for, t for a tincture normally? Anyone? For, what do we use today if someone's making a tincture? Say at home, a homemade one. Vodka, that's it, vodka. Vodka wasn't available in the past, so um, usually spirits of wine, wine that have been distilled to make it stronger. Oils, you could either make it by infusion, so you put, say, rose, pe rose petals in oil, put it on a windowsill somewhere sunny, and the sun does the job, heats up the oil. Or you could use this. That's an alembic. Um, and how it works, I'm going to dance around in front of the screen now a bit. Because I didn't bring a pointer. <laughs> what do you do with an alembic? You can use um, this to make distilled waters and essential oils. I used to think essential oils were, it's just aromatherapy, 20th century idea. But they go right the way back. So, you put the herb and the water in here. Far's underneath, sorry, I'm looking away, aren't I? The far is underneath, all boils up, steam rises up and condenses on the, the dome at the top, trickles down the spout and you collect it and the water is the distilled water and the essential oil is just, just floating on the top and can be taken off. Um, and finally, a, a lecture is... Um, that was made by mixing herbs with honey and conserves you made by mixing parts of the plant with sugar. And gentlewomen would spend hours and hours and days and days making their distilled waters and conserves. But we'll come on to that in a bit. Oops. Right, so what were the plants that were most commonly used? Actually, it's, um, it's surprisingly difficult to know about this. Um, people say, oh, if it's got the ending of the botanical name officinalis, it means they were used in monasteries. But that's not quite, quite true. It just means it's a plant with a long usage traditionally. But we do get a nice clue. Um, there's a, a plan called the Plan of St. Gaul. It's a plan of an ideal monastery. So what a Benedictine monastery should look like. And handily, it includes the infirmary complex and the physic garden next to the infirmary. And all monasteries would have had one of these. And here we go. It nicely lists for us what you should have in your monastery physic garden. So obviously, this would not have been followed to the letter. Obviously not. But it does give a nice idea of the most common ones that are coming up. So you can obviously read those for yourself. The ones, um, I've just put a question mark next to watercress because these were grown, oh, here we go. <laughs> these were grown in rectangular beds. Yep, so you've got a, a square garden, rectangular beds with the different plants and nice paths all around them. Why would you have a, a bed that's got water in amongst all these? It doesn't seem to make sense to me. So I think I'm going with other people that say, was it hedge mustard instead? But there we go. Lily and rose, you wouldn't get these used so frequently um, in medieval medicine, though they were used medicinally. But they're appearing in a monastery garden because they're symbols of the Virgin Mary. So they were grown a lot in monasteries for that reason. Another evidence we get is archaeological. Um, 
someone's done some work digging up Waltham or bits of uh, Waltham Abbey and they found all these seeds, they found 448 seeds of henbane. Remember henbane was one of the ingredients in that Anglo-Saxon sleeping drink. Um, and also seeds of hemlock. Now, if you find seeds, often you go, well, was that for food or was it for medicine? And it could be for both. But if the seeds aren't, if the flower isn't edible and hemlock and henbane are poisons and they aren't edible, then we know that they must have been medicinal. That's why they were using them. So it was probably, to, um, again, sleep-inducing or as an anaesthetic, pain relief. Henbane was used as an anaesthetic in surgery before we had sort of real anaesthetics. So what's the thinking underpinning how plants were used in this period? Now, somebody said in the Middle Ages that if you don't know what caused an illness, you couldn't help to cure it. And this doctor was obviously saying, so if you don't know what causes it, you can't possibly cure it. But obviously, I do. That was the implication. I do know what caused it. The irony was people in the Middle Ages had very, very little idea of what caused an illness. Um, medieval doctors used two main means of diagnosis, taking the pulse and examining the colour of urine. And the urine, they were onto a winner there because the patient didn't even have to be in front of them people would sometimes just send the urine in a basket or a flask and send it to the doctor and he would tell the person bringing the urine, oh, you can tell them that they've got this. <clears throat> These doctors were university trained and they tried to impress patients with the sophistication of their learning. And the chief thing they learned was the ancient Greek theory of the four humours. <coughs> Has anybody here heard of the theory of the four humours? Oh, a few people have. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's, it's really hard to, to overemphasise the importance of the four humours or humoral theory in the Middle Ages. Really hard to do that. Um, because uh, even in Chaucer, um, you know, Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, he talks about a doctor of physic there, and he says, the cause of every malady you'd got, he knew whether dry, cold, moist or hot, he knew their seat, their humour and condition. So ordinary people knew about the four humours. So let's have a go at unpicking this. We'll have to dance around a bit again. So, Aristotle said that there were four elements in the universe. Air, water, yeah, air, fire, earth and water. So you can see these picked out. Air, fire, earth, water. And he said that each of these elements had two qualities. And the qualities are either hot, moist, dry, cold. So, um, just one example, air is moist and hot. There we go. Earth is cold and dry. Okay. And this is the macrocosm. This is the universe. This is the big picture. But they believed that as that was the big picture in the universe, then you get the microcosm, which is what's in the human body and you get the equivalent, and that is the four humours, or these are four liquids that are in the body, and those are going round, they're blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And they have two qualities as well, just like the elements, so we can read this off, so um, blood was moist and hot, yellow bile was hot and dry, and so on and so forth. So, a person was healthy if all the humours were in perfect balance. If they're balanced, you can't help but be healthy. If they're not in balance, that's when you become ill. So, 
How did this theory, and remember this is, this is purely just a theory, there's no science behind this, how did this impact on herbal remedies? Well, there's one fairly crude way um, of rebalancing humours, and that's to get the excess ones, once you've got too much of, out of the body. And that's why bloodletting was such a common treatment. Um, bloodletting was the number one treatment in the Middle Ages. Um, but you could also use plants that had a purging effect. So one remedy said that, um, made from primrose root, said that this will bring about a sure and certain cure through means of forceful vomiting. And medieval men and women had a very good knowledge of which plants would have a laxative effect or which plants would make you sick. And to take an example from the end of this period, you've got Shakespeare's son-in-law, John Hall, and he left us his written-up case notes. And he talked about um, treating a Mrs Chandler of Stratford-upon-Avon, and his, and his treatment of her was right in this tradition of the four humours, getting rid of them. She had a uterine hemorrhage, um, and he treated her with a purge, which included well-known uh, laxatives like senna and rhubarb. And after she'd taken this purge for five days, she had bloodlet and she was declared well. Now, in the eyes of medieval men and women, these plants are working. This plant medicine is doing the job because it's having the effect they want it to have. They want it to make you sick. It's making somebody sick, so it's working. But is that beneficial for the conditions it's being used to treat? In the vast majority of cases, all it's doing is actually weakening the patient. So in that respect, that plant, those plant remedies were not working. But there was a, there was a more sophisticated way of, that the herbal remedies could fit the four humours. Um, because each of the plants as well were assigned two qualities. So mint can be called hot and dry. So to treat a patient, you choose the plant which counterbalances the humoral imbalance. So a cold is caused, if you've got a, a cold, as in snuffling the nose, it's caused by phlegm, which is cold and moist. But we've already said that mint is hot and dry. So you've got a cold, so you treat yourself with mint, which is hot and dry. Are you, are you following this? I know it's really, really convoluted. Um, so two more examples of how this works. This is borage. It's from a 15th century medical manuscript. And the entry begins, it says, borage is hot and moist. And then it says, the leaves produce good blood. Right, if we go back, if you look at blood there, and blood is, is hot, hot and moist, and the leaves, it says the leaves of borage are good for blood because they're hot and moist. That's, it doesn't actually state that link, but that seems to be the thinking behind it. Um, and it also says if someone's melancholic, you could give them a syrup made from a decoction of borage. Um, and in this theory, if someone has a melancholic personality, that was linked to black bile. So are you able to see this slide right at the back? You are. So black bile is cold and dry. And borage is hot and moist. So that will counter the coldness and the dryness of the melancholy. And to give one last example, um, we're told that a sauce made of sage and parsley and vinegar and a little powdered spices revives appetite weakened by coarse and cold humours in the stomach. And it says this is the case because sage water is hot and dry. So hot and dry countering cold that's causing the problem. And rose was held to be cold and dry. So cold and dry rose is great for somebody who's got a fever 
because fever is a hot and wet condition. Hot because you've got a raised temperature and wet because you're sweating. How are we doing, everyone? Are we, are we all there? <laughs> oh, a few. <laughs> so, and it wasn't just our medicinal plants that had um, hot, cold, dry and moist. Food plants were given these qualities as well because we saw one of the medicines was actually a sage sauce. It was a sauce rather than a syrup or anything else. Um, and in the Middle Ages, if somebody um, was ill, actually medicine was at the second line of treatment. What you'd do first of all was to change their diet give them, it was going in through food. Then if the food doesn't work, then you try the medicine. And it's an idea that seems to have been very much, much lost. Having said that, herbalist, is, is, is that something, is, is dietary things coming in as well? Fantastic. Excellent. So you're hanging on something that's, that seems to have been lost sort of in, in mainstream medicine. So, if um, now there were other theories as well. This is a, a, a period full of theories and ideas. Spirituality was absolutely central to medicine as well. You couldn't, you couldn't separate spirituality from medicine. Actually, you couldn't separate spirituality from much in the Middle Ages. We're going to look at the plague now. Can you see God, God's up the top? The arrows, he's firing down, killing the little people at the bottom. These are plague arrows. The Virgin Mary is desperately trying to help out. She's holding out her robe so that she can catch some of the plague arrows. Um, now, I'm mentioning the fact that people thought that God had, cured the God had caused the plague because one of the ingredients to treat the plague that comes up again and again is the plant rue. And I think that this is because rue was seen as a herb of repentance. It was called, another word for it was herb of grace. It was used to asperge in churches. Asperge is where you, you, uh, you dip the rue in holy water and, and flick it everywhere. Also, rue is used in exorcisms, or was. Um, but as I say, it's the herb of repentance and people thought that the number one way to save yourself from the plague was to repent. Now I don't know for, for a fact, I, I've never read any of this, but that's my guess as to why Rue comes up again and again. Angelica, that was made into plague water. You paid a lot of money for Angelica in the Middle Ages for this reason. It was collected from sites all around London. Um, and Angelica, because somebody said um, that an, an archangel Michael had appeared to somebody and said that God is telling you that if you use Angelica, you can be cured of the plague. To go back to the, the theory of the humours again, this is spearwort. It's got a really acrid juice. It raises blisters. Um, beggars used to use it to raise sores, so people <coughs> pitted them more. And you could put that on your buboes to burst them, so that would draw out the bad humours. And finally, another idea about treating the plague was through astrology. This is fumitory. Have I said that right? Fumit, fumitory. Am I saying that right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and it was said to be a herb governed by the, um, the planet Saturn. And they thought that Saturn had caused the plague. So God had moved Saturn in the heavens and Saturn had caused the plague. So you can use a herb of Saturn to counteract it. So we'll look at astrology now because that's the other really big thing next to the, the humoral theory. Here we go. So 
today, astrology, we think about the um, we think about star signs, don't we? But it was the planets that they really thought about. They thought there were seven, and they thought that the moon and the sun were planets. So moon, sun, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. They thought that um, they all had influence on, on men's lives, the, plat the planets as well. Um, they thought that all the planets had their own personalities. So we've got Jupiter on the left. And uh, sorry, Saturn on the left, Jupiter on the right. Saturn's got his scythe and his chariots drawn by basilisks. And it says underneath, Saturn is cold and dry and melancholic. So we've got the four humours coming in again. And it's like the greatest misfortune man can have. Jupiter is hot and moist and sanguine. So, um, and here's the best thing that can happen to man. So they've got personalities. And they also thought that they ruled different parts of the body. So the planets ruled, uh, planets controlled different parts, and the signs of the zodiac did as well. So if you look at the top, Aries is sitting on the man's head. So the astrological sign, Aries, influences things, does it, it conditions of the head. Um, and also, the final thing that was believed was that each planet had its opposite. So Mars was opposed by Venus, Saturn was opposed by Jupiter, and so on. So, how does all these ideas affect herbalism? Well, they affected the choice of which plants were used. So, if a plant, so let's think about it. Um, up here, we've got, can you see Leo the lion? Yeah. And he's on the, on the chest, on the heart. Now, it was thought that, so Leo's ruling the heart. The flower marigold was said to be ruled by Leo. So if someone has a heart condition, you look for a herb ruled by Leo. So marigold's one of those herbs. Um, and the idea about the opposition. Basil was said to be ruled by Mars. Venus is the planet that opposes Mars and was linked to childbirth. So if a woman's trying to give birth and Venus isn't helping her, you can use basil, the herb of Mars, to, to help her out. And there's timing. You thought about astrology governed when was the best time to pick the plant, to make the medicine from the plant, and to apply it to the plant. Um, and if you're given a remedy that you want to help increase humours, you do it when the wound, moon is waxing. And to decrease the humours, you do it when it's waning. Oops. Now, if we look at what, um, if we look at what Nicholas Culpepper says about basil, it seems as if he's saying recommending basil because he's basing it on astrology. He says, um, a way to Dr. Reason went I, so Dr. Reason is using his own reasoning, who told me it was a herb of Mars and under Scorpion, so under the zodiac sign Scorpio, and it is no marvel if it carry a kind of virulent quality with it. Therefore, it can be applied to wasp stings where it will draw out the poison because every like draws its like. So you've got basil, it's governed by a warlike planet Mars, Scorpio, scorpion sting, all these things will help draw out a, a nasty sting you've got. So he's using astrology. So you'd think, well, is that right? But basil does work for wasp stings. So is Culpepper using a theory to explain something that he'd observed people doing for themselves anyway, that they'd worked out through experience that basil would help a wasp sting. Now, there are other uses in Culpepper. Sorry, have we all heard of Culpepper? Yeah? He's, a, he's a, the most famous herbalist there's been in England, and he wrote his herbal 1653. 
Um, and some of his remedies we do know were effective. Um, roasted onions eaten with honey or sugar help an inveterate cough and expectorate tough, stubborn phlegm. And when I speak with elderly people, many of them um, treat stubborn phlegm by slicing up an onion, covering it with sugar, and that produces a sweetened juice or a syrup, and that's what they use. Um, Culpepper also said that the juice of sage taken in warm water helps a hoarseness. So, and again, a, a simple homemade remedy for a sore throat is a sage infusion. Um, put some honey in this as well, because that would always help. So again, that's something people still use today. And staying with sage, Culpepper said it was an excellent use to help the memory. Now, I thought that that sounded one of the least likely ones, sage to help the memory. Um, you're shaking your head. Is that because you know differently or you're well, green? Sage is very good for the memory. There we go. Yep. <laughs> yep. There's, um, there's been research done in 2003. The Medicinal Plant Research Centre of England published studies at Newcastle and Northumbria universities where they um, tried sage oil herb pills against placebo pills and those who took sage performed better with a word recall test than the people who had taken the placebo. So students, that might be, might be worth thinking about. Um, but also, it's linked to Alzheimer's. Um, in 2003, the Journal of Clinical Pharmacy and Therapeutics said that people with Alzheimer's, if they were, they were given extract of sage, there were improvements in their memory and mental capacity. And they think that this works. Um, some believe that Alzheimer's is caused by a defect um, in the production of acetylcholine. Um, and they say that sage can mimic the action of acetylcholine. Um, they, they experimented on 30 adults, so it's not a huge sample, but they were given 60 drops per day of sage extract, and some were given a placebo, and after four months, there was a significant improvement in cognition. So it does seem that, that Culpepper was onto something there. So we've got different things going on there. If something was based purely on a theory, like the theory of the four humours, or astrology, or miasma theory, the theory that, um, that bad smells cause disease. So if you smell a sweet-smelling herb, that's going to correct you. If you're basing your medicine just on those ideas, it's unlikely that those remedies would have, would have worked. But if... if as well as those ideas that are being used maybe to justify the remedy, people knew that they'd, from experience had worked out that things worked and were overlaying a theory with it, then there's a high probability that that would work. So it's quite hard from a distance to unpick the two things. How are we doing? Are we coming up for the, the hour just about? Okay, so <laughs> I'll just finish this section by um, just talking about very quickly um, why the 17th century, the end of this period, is so big in the history of herbal medicine. And it's simply because, you know, herbal medicine existed before, existed afterwards, but this is where you get all the big sources, all the most famous sources, a real cluster of them. So this is our friend Culpepper, who we've, we've quoted. Whoops. Oh, yes, yeah. I, I did a little experiment before in preparing this lecture. And this is hardly statistically significant because we're looking at one plant. But just to see, um, get the idea of whether, how many of his remedies were likely to work or not. And this is a very, very unscientific way of doing it, but I picked Cherville. Now, 
I just chose Chervil at random from... I looked at his remedies that were shorter than others because he has some sage has 34 different uses for sage. But um, some are less, and Chervil's a fairly short one, but that's the only reason I lighted on it. And on the left, we've got what Culpepper says you use it for. So you can read that. And on the right, we've got what um, Denny Brown, in her Herbal of 2001, says chervil is good for. And you can see the only overlap is provokes urine and a diuretic. That's the only overlap there. Now, it could be that Culpepper was aware of uses that we're not aware of today. That could easily be the case. But equally, this does show or sort of give the lie to the, to the idea that in the past people understood um, every use of a plant and now it's, it's gone out of memory and we're rediscovering it again. That actually simply isn't true. That things like... Um, so, you know, things like wounds, jaundice, abscesses, these are things that come up in Culpeper all the time, and he would have mentioned them if he'd have known about them. And St. John's Wort, um, for, well, what's St. John's Wort for? All together now? Depression, that's, that's right, mild depression. Um, very well known for that today, uh, and accepted in you know mainstream medicine sorry it sounds very disparaging to say mainstream medicine and herbalism doesn't it but you, you know what i'm saying it's very well accepted st john's wort for melancholy that well they call it melancholy in the past doesn't come up in any 17th century source i've ever looked at likewise lavender to help sleep doesn't come up in the 17th century in any source i've seen so they weren't necessarily aware of everything, but on the other hand, it's hard to be sure that they didn't know of things that, that, that we're just rediscovering or still to rediscover. And actually, shall we, shall we leave it on, on that note? And you can have a, a well-earned break. <laughs>